You're listening to Market Champions, a podcast on navigating the financial markets. Here's your host, Srivasa Prakash. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. Today we've got Graham Rhodes from Long River Investments. Graham, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's awesome to have you. Thank you very much, Sri. It's really flattering to be uh, amongst this great group of guests that you have. Thank you. So I first wanted to start off by talking a little bit about your background, how you got into uh, how you got into finance and your journey to you know well, how, where you are today. Yeah, thank you. So I live in Hong Kong and I was uh, born here and raised between Hong Kong and New Zealand. And uh, to be honest, I really got into finance um, almost by accident, you could say. Uh, I was really interested in going to graduate school, but I didn't have enough money to pay for uh, the tuition overseas. So I ended up working in investment banking for three years to uh, save up enough money to go to Oxford, where I did my master's degree. And uh, while I was at Oxford, um, I wrote my master's thesis on how Chinese automakers were using uh, M&A to acquire foreign technology to move up the value chain. And I really, really loved that research process, you know, going out into China uh, and getting on the ground scuttlebutt to find insights into what these companies were doing. And so when I, I finished grad school, I really wanted to find a job in a similar kind of role. And that's how I switched from investment banking into um, equity research. So looking at companies in the public market. And um, my first job was with a local brokerage here in Hong Kong called CLSA. And I was very, very lucky because I was given this opportunity to kind of run wild in the uh, oil field services sector in China. And this was in 2011, just as the, uh, a lot of excitement was building up about the potential for a shale revolution, shale oil revolution in China. Mm -hmm. So I got to spend a lot of time crisscrossing the uh, oil fields in the Western deserts of China, trying to find as much like scuttlebutt and insight as I could to bring back to my clients in Hong Kong. And um, that was a lot of fun. But at the end of the day, like what I really wanted to do um, was to find good investments for my clients. And working on the sell side, you're constrained by a geographic focus and a sector focus. So I looked at what my, uh, my senior was doing. And there are three oil companies in China, three oil majors. And his job, you know, day in and day out was to tell his clients which of those three to buy and which to sell. And I always ask myself, um, what if the right answer to that actually is none of them? Uh, but you can't really offer that opinion on the sell side because you've got to come up with something. And so that's what really drove me to move over from the sell side to the buy side. Uh, unfortunately, like I didn't have much of a background in finance. None of my, my family works in this industry. So if I'd known what I was looking for a lot earlier, um, I could have saved myself a bit of time. It was only through this process of trial and error that I got mm-hmm. to be uh, sitting on the buy side working as an investor. And so for the last couple of years, I've been uh, in a variety of uh, roles in Hong Kong, investing across Asia. And then in 2019, I left to begin managing my, my own investments. And um, I do that uh, under the name Long River Investments. Uh, but to be clear, I, I don't actually manage any outside capital. Um, Long River is kind of a placeholder in case one day I do do that. And in the meantime, um, I have this website where I share some of my thoughts on uh, companies that I look at, as well as the investment research process as well. Right. And... And one of the awesome things is, you know, I uh, took a look at your last letter and, you know, it's pretty awesome. You, you've you compounded at about 22% over the last five years. So I think, you know, that's, that's pretty incredible. And um, so first I want to start off by, you know, talking about, so, you know, one of the things is you focus, uh, instead of just focusing on the U.S., you're focused on Asia as well. So I want to dig in and, you know, get into your process and the way you analyze, you know, different companies. So can we, uh, so where did you actually get started with value? You know, how did you, uh, how did you find that, you know, value was the sale that, you know, you were going to pursue, you know, was it just, you know, going through all the oil fields, trying to, you know, find the scuttlebutts or, you know, how did you exactly get started into value? Yeah, sure. Um, I think one of the, the best investments that I've ever made in my life um, was purely by accident. It was a stroke of good luck. And that's when I was, I don't know, browsing for something on Amazon one day. And I came across this uh, compendium of Warren Buffett's uh, annual shareholder letters. And I I bought that for something like $3 US. And everything that I've done well since then can all be traced back to that that initial investment. So best $3 that I've ever spent. 
And um, I think what, what Buffett did for me, right? So I, I had studied at university, and as I mentioned, I had, I had worked on the sell side at that point, uh, collecting Scuttlebutt, trying to find uh, insights for my clients. But what Buffett did for me was he gave me this framework for how to think about investing, how to think about business too, and to find the intersection of those things in a way that could grow my own wealth. So he really tied together a lot of loose threads and gave me uh, this analytical framework. Um, and I think that's been incredibly powerful. Now, you, you asked me, um, how did I, how would you say, become like a follower? I mean, value investing is kind of a cult. So maybe I'm a right. cultist um, of value investing. And this was this was the way. But I, I want to just take a second to, to share my thoughts with you on value investing. I think um, quite often it's unfairly pigeonholed into something which it isn't. So uh, there are really four tenets of, of value investing. Um, and in my opinion, they form more of like a prescriptive mindset, sorry, a, a mindset of how to invest rather than like a prescriptive method of how to invest. So if I can just go through those with you. The, the first one is that when we invest, we're investing in businesses, not stocks. Right. When we buy um, you know, shares on the market, we effectively become part owners of real businesses. And so that, that tenet forces you to think about what the drivers of that uh, business's value creation are as opposed to you know, factors like what the charts say or what's gonna happen in the market tomorrow. Because if you're the long-term owner of a business, there are only certain things that you care about. And, and often you, know, you don't see those on a Bloomberg screen. The second one is that you have to be uh, independent of the market. The market should be um, you know, your, your, your place where you go to sell, but it shouldn't be the guides like you're thinking. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I'm, I'm quite lucky, and maybe a lot of your, your listeners are too, in that, I'm kind of naturally very stubborn and naturally very contrarian. And I like to have my own um, independent thoughts. So I'll really take the time to go to first principles when I'm looking at something. And uh, for better or worse, I'm, I'm not afraid to stand alone. I'm not afraid to you know, say something that's a bit different from the crowd. Um, the third tenet of value investing is that because investing at the end of the day is fundamentally about making predictions of the future and making predictions of the future are very hard. We right. always want to invest with a wide margin of safety. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the fourth one is, and this is uh, what Warren Buffett appended to the teachings of uh, Benjamin Graham, is that we should, as best as possible, stick within our circle of competence. So if my expertise happens to be looking at some companies in China, I shouldn't be going out looking at some companies somewhere else because I just don't have the expertise to really, to really assess them. So when you, you take all those four things together, as I mentioned, like it's not something prescriptive. There's this awful idea out there that value investing should be equated with low multiple investing, just going out there and buying stocks trading at you know, single digit PEs or below their price to book. And uh, I think Benjamin Graham did that back in the 1920s and the 1930s for two reasons. First of all, um, there were lots of companies trading at those kind of prices back then. Right. Uh, but second of all, he was always very, very reluctant to make forecasts about the future. And so if you think about his style, right, which was to look for a so-called net nets, companies trading at um, below their uh, net working capital minus, minus debt. What he was doing was effectively saying, I want to buy something at less than one times next year's cash flow. Because if I could take control of the business and liquidate it, I can, I can make money, guaranteed. But unfortunately, that was a very difficult process um, once value started to, to increase. And also, you know, Buffett found when his capital um, began to accumulate, it was much harder to put money to work in small ideas like that. And so he, he moved to like uh, evolve the framework to think about other ways of creating value, mainly through the intangible assets that, that businesses create um, and what you can't see on the balance sheet. Right. And so when, when I think about this, when I think about value investing again, I'm, I'm really looking for um, trying to buy companies for less than their worth. And the, the difficulty there is exactly that question. What should they be worth? If we cut right to the core of it, we all know that the value of a company today is just the present value of all of its future cash flows. Right. Nothing more difficult than that. But to me, like it's about trying to predict those, and that's where the hard part is. And I think that's why, like I have, and Buffett has as well, steer towards these companies with uh, strong intangible assets because, frankly, they're they're more easy to predict. So that that's kind of been my evolution, uh, I guess, as well, like and how I see value investing. Um, some of the people I think who have written quite a lot about this are, you know, Buffett himself. But other managers, too, um, in this day and age, like uh, a guy called Robert Vinal, who invests in Switzerland, um, he's really helped my thinking uh, evolve on this thing. 
Got it. So did you start off as, you know, sort of a Ben Graham multiple kind of investor and then shift on to Warren Buffett or did you just, you know, straight, straight off jump into, you know, Warren Buffett kind of investing? Because I believe in the background, I can see a copy of security analysis. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I did. I did. Um, you know, everybody's going to start with the, uh, the grace, right? Right. And um, I think, I think my journey largely mirrors that too. So some of my early investments were in low multiple companies here in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is a wonderful treasure trove of small listed companies trading you know, below net cash uh, with high dividend yields and, and, and low PE multiples and that kind of thing. And uh, it's very seductive. Um, but what I found um, over time was often management were working at very different interests to me. So in my most recent letter, I talked about my um, experience investing in two companies. One was a bank in India called HDFC Bank, and one was a company here in Hong Kong called Citoy. And um, what I was trying to do there was use this framework from one of my favorite writers called uh, Annie Duke. And if right. you haven't heard about Annie Duke, She's written Thinking in Bets, right? <laughs> it's a great exactly. book, yeah. So for, for your listeners who don't know, um, Annie is a former professional poker player. She, I think, made it to like the Poker World Series on a, a number of occasions. Mm -hmm. um, but before that, in another life, she um, was a PhD candidate at Columbia, Columbia University, majoring in psychology. So she kind of brought this like incredibly robust framework to the challenge of thinking in environments of uncertainty, which happens to be poker, but which also happens to be investing. So when you think about situations like that, where we're operating in um, environments of incomplete information and where it's very difficult to link cause and effect. So what I, what I learned from Annie uh, talking about poker, I try to apply as much as I can in my day-to-day -day life as an investor. And um, so what I did in my most recent letter was comparing uh, you know, her framework, um, bad decision, good outcome, with bad decision, good outcome. Because what I was trying to do was to find um, what's actually repeatable for me, like what works. And on what can I build my investment process? And I use the example um, for bad decision, good outcome um, of a Hong Kong listed company here called Citoy. And uh, this had all the tenants of the classic Benjamin Graham investment. Actually, it looked, looked even better than that because it had a high ROE. So it was trading you know, below book value, had the high dividend yield, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but management were allocating capital in a horrible way. And I was so glued on looking at the past that I wasn't thinking at all about uh, the business's future. And actually it was facing enormous headwinds. And so there's the situation where like every year the company's results got worse and worse. And every year the stock price fell. Right. And judging on a PV basis, it kept on getting cheaper and cheaper. But actually it was basically destroying value and I was stuck, it was a trap. Um, whereas HCFC Bank was completely the opposite. And I think I paid something like three, three and a half times price to book for this. And uh, a lot of people might be thinking, why on earth would you ever pay that much for a bank? Um, but it is a really special situation there where for a number of different reasons, you can predict with, I think, quite good certainty that this bank will grow at a high rate for a long time to come. And more importantly, it can manage risk well. Um, so it's gonna avoid like the pitfalls that you might normally see in an emerging market, uh, especially with the credit cycle. And so, you know, I had this experience where one investment, you know, both investments worked, but one for the wrong reasons. And, you know, analyzing that, I came to realize that what works best for me are these situations where I can really study the, the company and try to find, like, what are the more enduring features of it. Um, right. And yeah. when you cut to the case for those, those are what help you make those long-term predictions. Um, when everybody else is focused on the short-term noise, you can see through that to what's going to last and what's going to endure. Um, so for me, that's that's been a really important part of my evolution. Got it. So I wanted to start off with how do you exactly source ideas, you know, especially when you've got something like Asia, so you've got, you know, thousands of stocks, you know, you own stocks in India, for example, HDFC, you, know, you own stocks in, you know, China or Hong Kong, like, uh, you know, Alibaba. So, you know, how do you go about, you know, actually sort of generating these ideas you know you can't really screen for stocks in asia so for example if you're in the us you've got finvis.com and you know you can just go on there and you can at least screen for say you know high margins high return on investment you can't really do that you know if you're in asia so you know how exactly do you uh, do you you know generate ideas to you know, start researching right um that's a really good question and so let me take you back to a word you used a couple of times a few minutes ago which is focus so I think as you mature as an investor, and again, 
as long as you're intellectually honest with yourself and you are able to use that framework to identify what were good decisions and what weren't, you know, focusing a lot on process, you can um, focus better on what works for you. Mm -hmm. And that cuts away at, you know, 99% of the, uh, the companies or the ideas are, that are out there um, to help you find the ones that are going to work for you. So while I might, in, you know, normally invest in, in three markets, mainly um, the U.S., China, and I have one, one investment in India, uh, I actually only have like a limited number of niches in which I invest. So my, my actual investable universe isn't, isn't that big. There might be 50 or 60 companies that I follow. And uh, again, for me, like the important thing was finding um, something that could be repeatable because you can't, you can't build like an investing track record on luck. I mean, not mm -hmm. over the long term anyway. So yeah. I, I had to. I had to find what works for me. And um, again, just to, to reiterate, what, what I look for are what I call exceptional companies. And these are companies which, once you really cut to the, the core of them, have some kind of enduring competitive advantage. And uh, to give you a couple of um, examples from you know, companies that I've looked at or companies I've, I've written about, uh, one of those might be Domino's Pizza Enterprises in Australia. You, you might think, um, you know, what, what's so great about a pizza company? But they have this... Um, concept, this business model, which was described by an investor called Nick Sleep as scale economy shared. Domino's would call it a quote unquote high volume mentality. But the bigger they get, the more value they pass back on to their consumers. So rather than keeping those economies of scale for themselves in the form of higher profits and higher margins, they're constantly trying to give more value uh, back to their customers. So you get more for less mm -hmm. than buying pizza. And what that does is, is it makes it harder and harder for a competitor to catch up with you and match your value proposition. And so, you know, personally, when I'm trying to think about what the future is, that, that's something that I can, I can understand and bank on quite reliably. Uh, another might be with HDFC Bank, this idea of how is it that they manage risk well? To me, um, that's a very much underappreciated part of the, uh, the story there. And you really have to dive into things like the shareholding structure, um, how they have like a low cost of funds, you know, what their incentives are and, and that kind of thing. But again, that, that should endure. Um, so I look, for, I look for situations like that. Um, those are what excite me. Then um, another thing that I've realized over the years is uh, actually growth is quite important. So I, I get like growth is kind of the flavor of the month and uh, a lot of growth stocks are very, very well last year. Um, but as a, you know, you can, you can see my office behind me. Um, I'm just one guy uh, working here. I don't have the, the resources or the muscle um, to compel companies to do anything. Right. And that makes me quite, quite different from Warren Buffett. So for all of the Berkshire Hathaway subsidiaries, he has quite a strong say over their capital allocation. He loves it when they reinvest, either to, to build their moat or to grow. But it's also okay when they have no reinvestment opportunities. They just send that money back to Omaha and he can use it somewhere else. It's, it's very different for 99.9% .9 of other public companies because they have something called the institutional imperative. If they give you that money back, they're never going to see it again. Um, and that CEO is not going to get a higher bonus next year. So for me, like capital allocation is critical and growth is one way to protect against bad capital allocation. Because if you're in a market with a long runway ahead and you can see the business being able to reinvest and expand, that kind of saves you from a lot of misadventures uh, when people are investing elsewhere. So that's something else that I, I've come to learn is very important in my uh my, my stock selection and, and what I look for now in companies. And, uh, you know, the third thing that I, I staple on top of that is um, ambitious management. So you can have those two things. You can have, um, you know, enduring competitive advantages. You can have that um, runway for growth. But if you don't have people who are willing to, you know, get up there in the morning and fight to take it. And execute, um, yeah. It's not very good. So another way to think about that is, um, you know, at the end of the day, we're all operating in a very uncertain uh, environment in a complex world. And when I invest in a company, I'm delegating um, management of that complexity to the company itself. And I want to know that the people there are you know, smart enough um, and create enough to you know, not only handle, handle challenges, but to find opportunities for me. So I, I do spend quite a bit of time looking at, at management as well. No, and uh, one of the stocks that you've mentioned repeatedly, uh, you know, so far is HDFC. And, you know, I want to, uh, you know, dig into HDFC. So could you, uh, you know, you can't reveal too much due to regulation, but, you know, what are the main drivers of HDFC? And, you know, what separates HDFC from, you know, all the other banks in India? So, you know, for example, you know, one of their major competitors is the ICICI 
uh, you know, bank. So, you know, what separates HDFC from these other banks in India? Okay, sure. Um, so if you're, to begin with, if your listeners want to know about this more in detail, I've, I've written extensively about HDFC Bank on my blog. So you can just look on longriverinv.com um, and you'll see my, my thoughts there in um, quite a lot of depth. Uh, but to give you a bit of background, uh, India is, you know, either the world's first or second largest country. Um, and since it began its process reform in the, you know, late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, it's been growing its economy at, at quite a high rate quite an attractive rate. At the same time, um, you're starting from a base with very low credit penetration in the economy. So there's lots of room for you know, banks and lenders to actually grow their loan books at a faster rate than GDP. So that combination of you know, high GDP growth or higher than global GDP growth plus uh, higher than GDP credit growth is quite an attractive tailwind for a bank of any kind. Um, and then the really important thing to know is in the 1990s, kind of as a workaround to a lot of union problems, the uh, government at the time introduced private sector banking uh, to the equation to challenge the uh, incumbent public sector banks and to spur them on into greater efficiency. So they came in and they had this uh, wonderful license to operate, which protected them politically, mm -hmm. um, but it also just was a market with a lot of low hanging fruit. You know, it might've taken you months to open a checking account kind of thing. And if you could offer something better than that, um, well, the market was just yours for the taking. So over the last 30 years, um, HDFC Bank and its peers have progressively taken more and more market share away from the incumbent uh, state-owned banks. And that's another tailwind as well. So, you know, if you can take market share, again, you can grow your loan book faster. Um, and I think what really separates HDFC Bank from its peers, in my opinion, is just the way it's managed risk. So a lot of banks, uh, unfortunately, they get too excited. They lend very quickly, um, a little bit like, uh, investors, you know, whatever the flavor of the month is, they all want to be there. Um, and unfortunately, that often blows up in their face. Right. And HDFC Bank, like over a number of different cycles, when its competitors have zigged, they've zagged. When their competitors have lent, like dodgy people in big infrastructure projects, they've gone the opposite way and said, no, thank you. We don't want any of that. And you ask yourself, like, how is that possible? And I think um, there's a number of different uh, factors there. And I think one of the most important is that they have a shareholder who has a long-term vision for the bank and isn't obsessed with quarterly earnings. So if you were, you know, management without like a lot of um, tenure, if you didn't have the confidence of your shareholders, you would be sweating over every quarterly earnings call, especially when right. your peers are growing much faster than you. But if you've mm -hmm. got someone behind you who says, look, you know, we're not building this bank for next quarter, we'll build, we're building it for the next century. You can make very, very different decisions. Okay, and I think having that kind of um, privilege to be contrarian goes a long way in banking. Um, another thing that they did was just to provide excellent retail service. So that allowed them to build uh, a very low cost fund base. And what's kind of neat about having a, a low cost uh, advantage in banking is that you can still earn very, very good spreads without taking as much risk as your peers. So if you think like, you know, you're borrowing at like 8%, you want to make a 5% spread, you've got to lend to someone who's going to you know, give you a 13% return kind of thing, that's probably going to be at the more risky end of the market. But if you're able to borrow at like three or 4% and you want to earn that, that spread, you can, you can lend to someone much safer and still earn just as much money. So I think those two advantages have played out um, over, you know, it's almost three decades now uh, as HCSC Bank has become, I think, India's largest lender by market cap. Um, and I, I, I'm very um, happy about that. I'm very grateful. Uh, and I still think it has sort of, uh, you know, decades of this um, ahead of it, the same playbook. And, you know, one of the things that most people in value are averse to is, you know, sort of looking at the macro picture and, you know, they choose to focus on the bottom up instead of the top down. And, you know, when you're dealing with a bank like HDFC, especially when it's in an emerging market like India, you have to still focus on top down. And I believe you mentioned that, you know, one thing that you focus on is the credit cycle. So, you know, so could you talk about sort of like the macro drivers that are in place for HDFC to grow? Yeah. Um, so I, I want to, I thought of something else. I'm going to talk about the macro side and I'm going to talk about something else to do with uh, value investing. If you'll let Absolutely. Me. Yeah. With, with regards to HDFC and the macro cycle, um, India is going through a banking crisis. It's, it's not in the headlines of the financial times every day, but India has been in a rolling bank crisis since at least 2008, you know, since post the global financial crisis. 
um, if you add it up now, it's like 12 or 13 years. And um, you might think like, gosh, how can you invest in an emerging markets bank through the middle of a rolling credit crisis? Um, but I'm actually really excited about that because when you're the last bank standing, when you're the, the bank with like the best balance sheet, uh, the best ability to lend, you can cherry pick your clients. You mm -hmm. can lend to them on your terms. You, you dictate the rates. It's fantastic. And so this has really um, accelerated that market share gain um, as HDFC Bank has been able to capitalize on all its uh, competitors' mistakes. So yeah, actually, again, like they manage the complexity of the world for me. But the way I see that um, is that this is a fantastic opportunity for them. Imagine if you were the last man standing in a place like that. Right, yeah. It's, great. it's almost like a monopoly there. Not, not quite a monopoly. Like there are still other people right. lending. It's so almost like one. In, in, in 2020, um, when COVID struck, um, these guys were the only ones lending. And you mm -hmm. know, they, they saw this like massive increase in their deposit base, uh, but they were able to grow loans as well. So having like the ability and the confidence to do that is, is really something. Um, now, now, Sri, I just want to go back because you said um, a lot of value investors get hung up on, on macro. Uh, I, I wanted to touch on something that value investors also get hung up on, which is learning and adapting. So if you think about like the struggle that value investors have had, you know, so-called value investors over the last uh, 12, 13 years, I think it's been moving away from like traditional old line stocks, like let's call it the Coca-Colas of this world, towards, you know, digital, digital companies like Alphabet, Google, or a slate of others which have done um, even better over the last uh, couple of years. And, and I think they've really struggled with tech. They really struggled because, um, you know, Buffett said famously after the tech crisis, like, I'm never going to invest in tech. And a lot of people took that as gospel. So I just want to go back to um, what I said earlier. At its heart, value investing is trying to buy something for less than it's worth. And if we define, you know, worth as the present value of all future cash flows, that actually affords us, like, an enormous flexibility to look at anything, any kind of company, any kind of situation. We, we really shouldn't be, like, um, blinkering ourselves with things like you can't buy tech. Uh, and I think um, that's been a really important progression for me, like having, having fallen into that trap, but then also dug myself out of it. Um, and I think a lot of other you know, value investors still haven't quite made that journey yet. So I just wanted to emphasize, like, there's nothing incompatible um, about value investing with investing in you know, digital companies or, or you know, newer economy companies. You know, one of the newer economy companies that you own is Alibaba. So do you have any thoughts on, you know, say antitrust issues with Alibaba, for example, and, you know, sort of making sure, uh, sort of uh, the fact that in China as a whole, the, the macro matters a lot more, you know, compared to say in the U.S. So do you have any thoughts on, you know, say any antitrust regulations against Alibaba? I believe Alibaba is your largest position. Is it? I, I don't disclose my, my position sizes. Okay. You, you might have seen it on, on something I published where I list my largest investings alphabetically. Um, oh, so it was alphabetically, my bad. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but, but that's a really good question. And um, if I can just go back to this idea of what I'm looking for, enduring competitive advantages, what, what I think uh, has happened and, and arguably is still happening is that the market persistently underestimates the strength of these digital uh, companies, call them what you will. Um, because if you think about like the pre-digital pre age, most forms of competitive advantage um, work through you know, economies of scale or some kind of natural monopolies. Uh, they weren't easy to disrupt, but it was possible. Uh, whereas now like we have these digital economies, who, uh, sorry, companies whose advantage rests on things like network effects, okay? And I think, those are much harder to disrupt. And so, you know, they've, they've just persisted for far longer than the market had originally anticipated. And um, investors like me have been quite lucky because you can, you can invest in these uh, companies which are effectively monopolies with growth. And I don't think that's been appreciated. And uh, that's certainly been a tailwind for me. Um, when it comes to Alibaba, uh, I, I don't want to go into the details too much because frankly, I'm a little bit unclear about what's going to happen. But my original investing case for that was, this is again, like a monopoly with growth. They had uh, the largest market share in China e-commerce and it looked like a few years ago anyway, they had completely crushed their uh, competitor, uh, Jingdong, JD.com. Um, now fast forward to today and yes, you're right. Like the state has decided that um, it's time to tackle these monopolies. 
Um, and in China, they've been quite expansive in their definition of what does constitute a, a digital platform. It's much more expansive than the um, traditional antitrust uh, you know, concept in, in the United States, which focuses on price. And so mm -hmm. the state has like basically said, we're, we're coming to do something about this because it's time to, to level the playing field. Uh, it's still not clear how that's gonna, gonna happen, but you know, the intention is there. What, what I find kind of ironic about that, and arguably as an investor, even more unsettling, is that this antitrust action comes at a time when competition for Alibaba arguably has never been more intense. So I just mentioned before that when you know five years ago you looked at the company, it seemed like they were streets ahead and they had no competition. Now, not only has uh, Jingdong um, made a resurgence, uh, there's also other competitors like Jinduoduo, which is a company you know less than five years old, but greater than 100 billion market cap. And when they reported their earnings last quarter, um, they disclosed that their you know active buyers over the last 12 months has now actually exceeded Alibaba's. Right. Um, and you have companies as well like Meituan, um, who in the not too distant future, you can imagine um, will start biting into that e-commerce, that retail market as well. And I think what's, what's really happened there, Alibaba, uh, you, could, you could argue that it's enduring competitive advantage used to be trust. Um, the e-commerce market in China used to be a wild west where you never knew what you were buying, whether it was real, whether it was fake, whether the guy like would just take the money and you get nothing at all. Um, whether the logistics would work, you know, whether your you know, order would come sort of busted up uh, mm -hmm, or not. Yeah. And every one of those fronts, like Alibaba came up with a solution. Okay, you know, you can't trust payments. What are we going to do? We're going to create Alipay. We're going to put your money in escrow. And the seller is not going to get it until you've confirmed that you've got your order and it's in good shape. Boom, we have trust. Um, and things like that. Reviews, whatever. And in a way... I think it's been a victim of its own success because the ecosystem in China is now so robust, like so vibrant, that really anybody can plug and play into that uh, infrastructure, be it payments or logistics or marketing or uh, traffic, otherwise, um, to enjoy the same benefits that Alibaba used to have. So there's no longer any monopoly in trust. In fact, like trust has become so ubiquitous that it's no longer a competitive advantage. So in, in my mind, like that's been a very um, important reversal uh, in the situation with Alibaba. Yeah. So where has the competitive advantage you know, shifted from trust? So you know, where is it headed? Well, if you, if you look at um, Pinduoduo now, um, I think they were really smart because they tapped into something which was social buying. So they were able to um, let people get excited about sharing deals with their friends um, and accessing lower prices. Uh, they also began in like a part of China, you know, arguably rural or lower tier China, um, which was less penetrated by e-commerce um, and where lower prices were more attractive. So they got their roots there. And then again, there's kind of a flywheel to this thing where like the more momentum you get, the more you can offer your consumers and it just keeps perpetuating. In fact, the flywheel spins faster and faster and faster. And obviously the momentum over the last five years has been enough to carry them now to a point where they've, they've surpassed Alibaba. So I think, I think that was kind of uh, one, like looking at lower prices. Um, and another was uh, with JD, I think, which because of its vertical integration was able to offer, you know, a more integrated customer experience and arguably mm -hmm. like a better one too, where you could be sure about the goods you were buying and you could be very confident that, you know, if you ordered in the morning, they'd reach you in the evening. So that, that's a big difference. And then, uh, you know, behind all of that, um, if your listeners know anything about um, the internet in China, it's basically been a war over the last uh, 15, 15 to 20 years between two camps, Alibaba and Tencent. You know, these two walled gardens, which have been um, right. fighting for the crowd very, very fiercely. And uh, it looked like Alibaba was ahead. But then in 2017, I think, Tencent radically um, updated its main product, uh, this social messaging app called WeChat to include a new feature, mini apps. And um, they turbocharged uh, traffic for all these other companies like Pinduoduo and JD. And really, I think, um, permitted that resurgence again that we've seen in the last few years to take on Alibaba. So there's been a lot of change there. And again, like the point is, Definitely. it's kind of ironic to me that the antitrust action comes at a time when competition has never been more intense. Got it. And one of your other holdings is, you know, Nintendo. So I wanted to ask you, what is the future of gaming in Asia as a whole? 
So I believe in India, there was an IPO, I think it's called the Zara Games or something like that. So, you know, as a whole, what is the future of gaming in Asia? Okay. So I, I think to, to answer that question, what is the future of gaming in Asia? Um, I always like to study history and to go back in, as far in time as possible to understand the development of an industry, the development of a company, um, because I find that very helpful for identifying those enduring trends again. And so if you think about like, what is gaming in Asia? It already has like a multi-decade history. And, you know, beginning in the 1990s, I think the first ever MMORPGs um, were launched in South Korea. And uh, so when I, when I was looking at um, South Korea, I used to cover it um, in my day job. Um, I found that there were very few, you could call them consumer staples companies in Korea with the same brand loyalty as something like Coca-Cola has in the West. But if you looked at the gaming companies through that same lens, um, they had many of the same characteristics. So you had a very loyal customer base who made repeat purchases. And these companies had a lot of pricing power as well. So you know, they're, they're quite interesting businesses there. And I think what you've seen is like a different model of uh, game develop in Asia that you found in the West, where they have um, free to play. So instead of buying like your $60 Nintendo cartridge, you can download a game for free. And then you might pay, um, you know, a little bit here and there to upgrade, you know, the, the clothes that your avatar wears, or the weapons that you use. And it's a very, very different model. Because, you know, if you think about like Mario, when Nintendo puts out a game, there's always a beginning and there's always an end. Even with something uh, open world like Zelda Breath of the Wild, there is a beginning and there is an end. Whereas many of the best games here in Asia, um, they're open world evergreen games where people can literally spend like decades of their lives building up an identity there um, and being part of a community. And so I, I find like that kind of social aspect of gaming here um, quite interesting because I think it's a much more enduring um, you know, habit than you know, playing whatever's hot, finishing it, putting it down, and looking for the next thing. Uh, when I think about the future of gaming here in Asia, uh, obviously China is the world's largest, I think ties sort of neck and neck um, in, in size with the United States, um, but it's certainly a very vibrant and dynamic uh, gaming market. And um, a lot of people have grown up with games here as well, so there's a lot less stigma around playing them uh, that you might find uh, elsewhere. And, I'm really excited to see now, like some of the companies here, uh, taking what they've learned over the last few decades and moving it abroad. So there's companies like Tencent, which has already been like a very prolific investor uh, around the world. Um, there's companies like NetEase, which I've written about on my, my blog as well. And they're now partnering with a number of um, you know, Western uh, IP owners um, to put out games like Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter or uh, Diablo um, for Western markets. And I think it's gonna be really exciting to see uh, what they've done there. And obviously like the, the breakaway hit in the last uh, 12 months has been a game called Genshin Impact, which to go back to Nintendo um, was basically modeled off of Zelda Breath of the Wild. But unlike Breath of the Wild, which again had that beginning and end, um, Genshin Impact is a true like open world MMORPG um, where you can just immerse yourself uh, in, in, in that environment and keep playing and playing and playing. So in a sense, like I really like Nintendo. Um, they have a lot of, uh, good things ahead of them. But it's interesting to see, like, and important to highlight what else is happening in Asia as well. It's a very vibrant ecosystem. Got it. I wanted to go, you know, one step back to our previous question about Alibaba. So do you have any thoughts on the antitrust of, you know, all Chinese big tech? You know, it's sort of, it's sort of in the U.S. as well, you know, this sort of antitrust regulation. And so I just wanted to hear your thoughts on, you know, all you know, sort of Chinese big tech and any antitrust regulation? Okay. I, I think the way that I would answer that, um, if you'll let me, is, is a bit more of a, a general answer rather than anything too specific. And um, I think it's important to know, like if you're investing in Asia, um, most, most of the large economies here, well, all of them really have adopted uh, a market economy as a means of allocating resources. And uh, be it Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, and most recently mainland China, it's been phenomenally successful. But where I think you know, these countries differ from the West is that this idea of market fundamentalism or capitalism as an ideology has never really taken root. At the end of the day, like the market is a tool to serve society. It shouldn't be like a fate to which we, you know, which we put in front of everything else. Uh, and the implication of that is business does need a strong 
how would you say, licensed to operate. It really needs to be serving the best interests of society in order to um, be permitted to, to do what it does. And so I think for a long time, like the, the tech industry in China um, has, has done that, right? Like if you think about China's transition in the early years of its growth, it was all about um, you know, what economists call uh, extensive growth, better allocating resources. So quite specifically moving people from the countryside to the city where they could find um, employment in jobs of higher productivity, you know, going from being a farmer to a factory worker. And uh, you see, saw like the greatest migration on earth, like hundreds of millions of people uh, making that journey to do so. Um, but that, that reaches its limit. And I think like the limit was hit in about 2008 or 2011 um, when that supply of like cheap and abundant labor ran out and wages started to, to rise quite rapidly in China. Um, so the only way to like counter that and remain competitive was to focus on what economists call intrinsic growth, improving your productivity. And um, that requires like a lot of reinvestment, R&D, um, branding, you know, for differentiation and, and so on. And that wasn't what like a lot of Chinese companies had, had grown up on. That's only come quite recently. And so the tech sector was like hugely important at that point because they were one of the, the main drivers of productivity growth in China uh, as they helped to like digitize the economy um, and make business more efficient. And I think, you know, they fulfilled that role beautifully. So if you think about like Alibaba or um, more recently, Pinduoduo, one of the things that they did was to remove all the layers of distribution uh, from the retail chain. So before, like from the producer to the consumer, you had all these people who would be taking a cut uh, at different steps of the way. And that didn't really add any value. It only pushed up prices. And actually when the economy was um, you know, growing really quickly, it also added to inflation. And it was very difficult for the government to control. So if you had like a digital company in there um, taking that all out and doing logistics in a much more efficient way or reaching consumers in a much more like targeted way, um, you could remove all those costs and basically share the value more fairly between uh, producers and consumers. And in the case of Pien Duoduo, they, they did even better. They basically helped all these farmers in China to get rich. <laughs> so before, like you might have sold your, you know, your watermelons for, for one dollar and the consumer paid eight. Now the farmer is selling them for two dollars and the consumer is paying four. So the farmer's you know, income is double kind of thing. Right. And that is a huge benefit to society, if you think about it. Um, I think now we've, we've reached a stage, though, where like the power of these two um, groups, again, Tencent and Alibaba specifically, uh, has become so pervasive that perhaps the government feels it's time to, to rein them in. And uh, it's important, if nothing else, to remind them that they need to serve society in order to have that license to operate. I'm, I'm not sure what the specifics of this will be, but I, I like to mm -hmm. keep that framework back in my mind. Got it. I wanted to move on to something, you know, that's pretty, it's pretty much, you know, very important when it comes to value investing. And that's the concept of position sizing. And, you know, one of the things that Warren Buffett does and is to, you know, usually bet big on your best idea. So, you know, how do you, I know you don't reveal your position sizes on your letters, but, you know, how do you think about position sizing? Sure. Um, Again, I, th I think position sizing is like a subset of a bigger question, which is risk management. And so if it's okay with you, I, I'd like to tackle that in two ways. Mm -hmm. So the first one is um, investment risk management. How do we make sure we you know, don't buy things that blow up? And uh, for me, like the critical thing there, the best way to manage risk um, is to know my companies. You know, I spend an awful lot of time like trying to dig into them to find what, what I call these enduring competitive advantages. Um, you know, I'm doing a lot of reading, uh, be it like biographies, history books, um, quarterlies, annuals, transcripts, getting on the ground, all that kind of thing, to make sure that I know um, what the enduring advantages are and when they're being challenged, when things are changing. Um, and so to me, like, if I can't understand a company or if I don't feel like I know it to that degree, it's going to struggle to make it into the portfolio. So that, that's really my first management. Then I think the second um, strand of risk management is emotional risk management, because the worst thing that you want to do is to be shaken out of the market when things go bad. So, you know, we, we also as recently as uh, last year that in the space of like just six weeks, uh, even like liquid supposedly efficient markets can fall by 30% or more very quickly. And uh, I know, you know, a lot of people on Twitter or, or elsewhere aren't going to say this, but I was really scared. I mean, it was very, uh, difficult and really stressful to see that happening. Um, but it was a wake up call. And I thought to myself, like, 
how am I going to survive to um, do well in that kind of situation again? And it really made me think about the importance of emotional risk management and setting yourself up in such a way so as to reduce the stress that you're feeling in that kind of situation. And um, I think that is just as important as any kind of investment due diligence that you do. So how do I do that? It, it might be things like making sure that you don't invest more than you can afford. So you, know, you don't want to like put 150% of uh, you know, your, your net worth into, into mm -hmm. the market unless you're prepared to stomach that. Um, it might be doing things like not spending all day in the office looking at Bloomberg. Not, not that I did that anyway, but if the market's falling and all you're doing is watching like prices collapse, man, that's, that's not healthy for you. So get out there, go for a run. Um, make sure you have a good family life. Make sure you have good hobbies. Um, and so the way I think about that is if you want to be a true value investor, if you want to um, invest with a margin of safety, you've also got to live with a margin of safety. Like that concept doesn't just end with uh, you know your investments in your portfolio. It really has to encompass your whole lifestyle. That's really like a mentality kind of thing. Right. Um, and again, I've, I've written about my experiences on on, on my blog. Uh, if your listeners want to to read about my thoughts in more detail. Now, finally, to get to your specific question about position sizing, you can see why I, I think of this as a subset of the uh, the larger question. A position should be no bigger than what you're comfortable with. At the end of the day, like you go to sleep well. And so, you know, if something's too big, if something's too uncertain, if you're like waking up at three in the morning in a cold sweat because of it, well, that's just too big. Now, how do I, I think about that? I, I'll give you one example um, of a friend of mine because at the end of the day, like this all relates to, to certainty, how well you know the company and how reliable you think your forecast of the future are. And this friend of mine was so sure um, about the position that he actually went like more than 100% of his net worth into it. And that was in, I think, 2011 or 2012 when Berkshire was trading at, let's say, one times price to book or one point one times price to book. And Warren Buffett said he was going to buy back shares uh, at 1.1.2. This was as close to a sure thing as you're ever going to get in the market. And uh, my friend went all in on that. And guess what? He slept really well <laughs> because, you know, there's a difference between position sizing and risk. And in that case, um, he thought the risk was, you know, insignificant. Mm -hmm. So that's what he did. In, in my case, um, I think about position sizing in terms of two factors. So the first one, again, is that what lets me sleep well at night? Um, if I have, you know, some position uh, in a company where I think the prospects are good, but perhaps like there's some asymmetry there. There's uh, some chance of like losing money, but I'm being compensated by like a greater chance of making money uh, or more money. And I'm happy to have that, but it's probably not going to be as big a position as something where I can earn like a more predictable return over time. Um, and then the other thing that I think about as well as you know, my sleep is, uh, you know, the number and the quality of ideas that I'm getting. So if you're someone who's lucky enough to have like lots and lots of good ideas burning from every day, maybe you can have 100 stocks in your portfolio. Mm -hmm. But again, like you're, you're looking at the team here, you're looking at the office, I, I don't have that luxury. And so when I, I find something that's good, I do tend to make it a big position simply because that kind of opportunity is, is rare. And you've got to seize it when you find it. Agree, yeah. When you say your friend had 150%, so that means he took on leverage on top of what he you know, normally had, right? Yeah, that's what I mean. Okay, got it. It's pretty crazy, huh? <laughs> well, that not really, because again, like this was as close to a sure thing as you're ever going to find. Right, if that's he, true. Uh, if he'd done that in some like YOLO mean stock, you know, forget about it. But, <laughs> <laughs> this was Agreed. Berkshire Hathaway. Buffett to come out and say, I'm going to pay you a higher price for those shares than what they're trading at today. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And one of the things that most people are skeptical about uh, is when, they're, when you're investing in Asia, you know, there's this chance of um, fraud in China, for example. So, you know, when you're researching companies, you know, you mainly focus on larger companies, but, you know, if, if someone focused on smaller companies, for example, you know, do you have any tips on how to, you know, sort of steer away from, you know, the more fraudulent companies in China? You know, for example, Jim Chanos of Kainikos and Carson Block yeah. of Muddy Waters have basically made their career shouting a lot of fraud in China. So yeah. I wanted to share your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, if I can, I, I want to answer that um, by first explaining to your listeners why, why I invest in China at all. And uh, the same goes for, for the United States and, and for India. So you might have heard Buffett say that he, he won the, the lucky sperm race or something like that. 
he just um, happened to be born, you know, in America, male, uh, and at that, that time that he was in 1930. And um, I thought about this, and I think one of the reasons why he says he was lucky to be born in America was because America has this very unique uh, economic machine, which produces what Li Lu will call continuous compound economic growth. Mm -hmm. So Buffett has been investing with a tailwind behind his back his entire life. You know, you can invest in like a, an average company, but thankfully, thanks to the American economic machine, you're going to benefit from like greater consumer demand or, or, or whatever kind of demand over time, thanks to that continuous compound economic growth. And so when I think about where I'm investing and I'm spending my time, uh, I've narrowed it down to you know, mostly uh, the United States, uh, China, and India, because I want that same margin of safety with my investment. Uh, particularly China and um, increasingly India, I think they've also entered or created these economic machines that give me that tailwind too. And so, you know, if HCFC has a bad year, well, over the next five to 10 years, I, can, I hope that I can be confident that growth will lift it out, uh, for example. Now, to your specific question of fraud, um, that's always a hard one. Uh, and one of the reasons I invest uh, in large caps, besides that idea of like monopolies of growth that we talked about earlier, was because it's much easier to like get information about that. Um, exactly. You can look at Tencent, for example, uh, I think it was listed in 2005. So we're getting close to like a 20 year history now of that company as a, a, a public, publicly listed entity. You can read what they're saying in their annual reports, you can check the news for how they behave. And uh, the management team is, to a large extent, like the same group of people who founded the company. So you can really you know, mm -hmm. know their track record. And uh, you know, when you look at an investment product, it always says uh, the past is not a reliable predictor of the future. Well, it's quite different with people. Um, you could look at how they behaved in the past, and actually, that is quite a reliable predictor of how they'll, you know, behave in the future. Correct. And so, yeah. finding people with that long track record to me is, um, you know, the most important part of uh, my due diligence process. It really narrows ideas down a lot. Um, and then, when it comes to small caps, you know, I, I do invest in smaller companies as well. Um, if you can find people again who have that um, good reputation or like a long track record, that, that can also help you get get comfortable. And uh, fortunately, you know, again, investing in Hong Kong small caps, um, it's not that hard to do. Uh, you can either get out there yourself and find your own scuttlebutt, or you know, I have quite a quite a good network of friends now who who help me to do that. Got it. So you know, if you're investing in Asia, for example, you don't have the same amount of information overall than if you're investing in the U.S. So, you know, especially you know when you're focusing on smaller companies. So you now, do you personally find it harder to do analysis in Asia, or do you you know, since you grew up there and you know since you basically uh, you know have your have had your entire investment career in China, do you just see you know them basically being the same? Um, I I'd say that like. You don't have to be on the ground here. So one of the, the best China investors I know lives in London. Um, another China investor I know who's really great lives in Toronto. Uh, of course, they spend like you know an exhaustive amount of time like looking at Chinese companies, but but they argue that you know being away from the market, apart from the market, actually helps their headspace. Mm -hmm. Again, like building some emotional resilience there. Um, what what I think is uh, another thing that's a really big difference. It's just how hard it is to find information here in Asia. So in the U.S., after the um, the dot com bubble, uh, there was a law passed which created I think it's called Reg FD, Regulation Fair Disclosure, uh, Fair Disclosure. And what that um, did was it stipulated companies had to uh, disclose publicly any record of conversations that they'd have with investors or any kind of investor days or presentations. And, and thanks to that, that's why we have like transcripts now for every every earnings call. Um, I don't think there's a single market in Asia with anything equivalent to Reg FD. And so what that means is, you know, you might have the company say one thing publicly, like through a filing, but then go out and meet with like 10 large institutional investors the very next day and say something completely different. And so, you know, often you'll find that as a small investor here, you're the last man to know about anything. And uh, I think, you know, that, that's something really hard to deal with. Uh, so. In fact, like it's actually easier, I think, to invest in the U.S. than it is to invest in. Got it. And to wrap up the podcast, I wanted to ask you: Are there any differences in your process for analyzing U.S. stocks versus analyzing, you know, Asian or emerging market companies? Ooh, I I don't think so. I mean, there's not a lot that I can do that a U.S. analyst can't. 
but perhaps I, I, I can do, I can, I can bring two things to the, the table. One of them is this analytical framework that I have. And um, again, I'm looking for these enduring competitive advantages. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, in the case of a lot of digital companies, these advantages are going to persist much longer than the market gives them credit for. Right. So I've, I've kind of taken that position. I've made that bet. And uh, well, so far it's, it's worked quite well. Um, on the other hand, I think one of the things that I bring as a person who looks at you know, different countries and different industries, um, I don't always have to be invested. Like I don't always have to own the US. I don't always have to own China. Sure. And if you just look at like the last um, three years, for example, there have been like lots of ups and downs, um, sometimes synchronous, sometimes asynchronous. And uh, from my seat here, I can take advantage of those. So when there's a big sell-off in China, as the U.S. is doing well, you know, put it, put it simply, I can sell U.S. stocks and buy Chinese stocks. And if you were purely like U.S. or China investor, you, you couldn't make that that uh, that kind of trade. Got it. Any closing oh, thoughts? Oh, go on. Just, just to add as well to that. Um, Having worked like at large institutional fund managers before, I think that idea of an emotional advantage, like a behavioral advantage, can't be underemphasized. It's really, really critical if you're trying to be a long-term investor, not to have someone breathing over your neck looking at like LinkedIn results or, or things like that. So the, the the kind of environment that I've tried to create for myself, and if any of your uh, listeners are thinking about investing in a manager, you want to look at that um, emotional resilience and how they've structured that into their business. Uh, you need to have the trust of your clients that they'll stand with you when, when things are getting difficult. Um, you need to have like a good family life. You need to um, be able to yeah. understand that. So that's perhaps like another advice that I bring. And of course, like I'm still working on that every day. Right. Got it. Any closing thoughts? Um, I think most importantly, it's just to thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you for being on the podcast. When you reached out to me, you know, just like a little guy here in Hong Kong. Um, so the, to join like the caliber of guests that you've had on your, your show before is, is really an honor. Um, I'm super impressed with what you're doing and I, I hope you continue it. And thank uh, you. I, I noticed that a lot of your guests use this segment to like offer a piece of advice. Um, you know, I'm just me, like I'm a bit old. I'll try to offer one thing that's worked really well for me. So going back to Annie Jukadan in Thinking in Bets, she talks about this poker group that she used to accelerate her learning. And um, it was really painful for her at first because these guys were telling her like, Annie, you know, stop feeling sorry for yourself. If you feel sorry for yourself, like you're never gonna get better. We need to look at this objectively. And you need to be like strong enough to hear honest and candid feedback. And um, she really credits that with, you know, being her breakthrough. Um, so one of the things that I've done here in Hong Kong, I've uh, worked with some friends to create a group called Value Asia. And we've basically copied or tried to copy Annie's poker group to a T. Mm -hmm. To create that people to offer each other candy feedback. And so to your listeners, like if you're able to find a group of friends or other people you trust um, to give you that same um, feedback and critique, it's going to be the most powerful catalyst for your learning that you can imagine. Because mm. you're yeah. going to be getting the kind of feedback you need to, to close the loop and help you to get better, be it as an investor or in any other kind of pursuit that you're following in life. So I really recommend that. Like have friends you trust who can tell you where you're wrong and how you can get better. Right, got it. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, Graham. It was awesome having you. Yeah, likewise, Shree. Um, thank you again. And uh, I look forward to, to following you.